Good afternoon to you all. You're all very welcome. I'm delighted that you've joined us today to attend our Institute of International and European Affairs webinar on privacy and the pandemic, the role of data protection and data processing in fighting COVID-19. My name is Joyce O'Connor and I chair the Digital Futures Group here at the Institute. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. It goes without saying that technology is impacting all our lives on a daily basis. The question is, however, how can we use technology to redefine problems and create solutions? Today, we are adding two other dimensions to this question, the question of personal data and the question of privacy. So how can we use personal data with technology to help us address the COVID-19 crisis? and how can privacy be protected while doing so. I'm very pleased today that we are joined by Wojciech Wiebereski, who is the European Data Protection Supervisor. Wojciech, you're very welcome, and thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us today. We appreciate it very much because we know you've got a very bu bu busy schedule. So Wojciech will discuss how personal data has and will continue to play an important role in the fight against the pandemic. He will speak for 25 minutes or so, and then we'll go to you, the audience, for questions and answers. You can submit your questions on the Q&A column at the bottom of your screen during the presentation or indeed afterwards, but I'd really appreciate if you could give your name and affiliation when you ask a question, and I'll come to them after Bob checks uh, keynote address. Today's presentation and Q&A is on the record, and the webinar will be available later on the IIEA website. Also, if you'd like to join us on Twitter, please do by using the handle IIEA. Now, it's my great pleasure to formally introduce our keynote speaker, Wojciech Wierski. Wojciech has a distinguished career. He served as Inspector General for the Protection of Personal Data at the Polish Data Protection Authority. He has been the European Data Protection Supervisor since December 20, or 2019. Wojciech, you are particularly welcome here today, and we look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for the possibility uh, to be with you. Thank you for the invitation from the Institute. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for using your time uh, to, to uh, spend it uh, to, to discuss the problems connected with uh, uh, privacy and data protection, which for me is just a professional job. For many of you, this is not only the thing that you are uh, meeting in your, uh, in your professional life, but also the thing which is interesting uh, as for the citizens and as for the people whose uh, fundamental rights uh, are observed by the European Union institutions and most, uh, uh, most importantly uh, by the controllers, uh, by the processors, so simply by all those uh, who are uh, uh, processing our data, who are processing information about uh, us. Uh, as you were told, I will try not to, uh, to, to bore you to death with the presentation for 25 minutes. <laughs> and uh, after that, there will be the time for the question and answer time mainly connected with this subject, but of course I am ready to answer other questions if I can, um, if, I, if, I'm, if I got the information that might be interesting for you. And uh, if there was something which needs uh, the immediate answer, also during the presentation, uh, please, uh, uh, maybe Joyce, you will be able to, to uh, uh, simply uh, break, uh, to break me and uh, to interrupt me and to uh, ask the question or the, the need for the explanation uh, from okay. some of the participants. Of course, I will try to uh, speak uh, in the most, uh, uh, most, pro most open and easy manner, but uh, as all the people who are dealing with it uh, professionally, I have the tendency to uh, speak with the slang and if I start to speak slang, please stop me and say that I would should uh, explain the things. Sometimes we are using some, uh, some uh, abbreviations that might not be that uh, uh, obvious for uh, the people. 
I will share my screen and I will share the presentation with you. Uh, but uh, uh, actually most of the things uh, which uh, I'm going to talk about uh, are out of the uh, presentation itself and the presentation is only supplementing it with some um, additional uh, uh, information. So I try to uh, share the screen now and please uh, confirm that uh, you see it uh, in the right manner. Is it uh, visible? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So as we said, the, the, the main subject for today is the privacy and the pandemic and the role of the data protection and privacy in fighting with COVID-19, uh, but also the, the influence of all this crisis uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the attitudes towards privacy, attitudes towards uh, data protection, attitudes towards European Union itself, and uh, for the states, because we will we will uh, easily come to the main conclusion, which is that uh, the world trust will be present in each and every discussion that we will be dealing with. And uh, of course, I know this is a kind of buzzword. This is the, the word which always exists when we start to talk about uh, my fundamental rights uh, and internet when we say about in fundamental rights and new technologies and to fundamental rights and the states and the administration. And all this was present uh, in the biggest crisis that we had uh, uh, in uh, our lives uh, uh, for, for at least uh, 20 years. Uh, global crisis, which is important. It, it was not only for, the, for Europe, it was not only for the European Union, not only for the Western civilization, as we call it, uh, but uh, everywhere uh, in the world, uh, the um, influence uh, of the pandemics is well visible and uh, sometimes start to redefine the way that we uh, approach the security, the way that we approach uh, the health issues, but also this trust toward public institutions uh, and towards the, mm, uh, and towards the uh, business uh, and uh, the companies. So I should start, uh, as we always start uh, the presentations uh, in uh, uh, data protection field, saying, ladies and gentlemen, dear data subjects. Uh, I, I do it in order to stress again that uh, the data, personal data, is not a commodity. It's not something that we find in the coal mines. It's not something that lies somewhere on the servers of some other uh, institutions or the companies. But this is an information about me, about you, about our closest uh, persons, about our families, our friends and enemies. And uh, this information uh, may touch very uh, strongly uh, the, our intimacy, our privacy, those things that we usually want to stay either for us or for our families um, only. The European Data Protection Supervisor, as the Data Protection Authority of the European Union institutions, bodies and uh, agencies, uh, have been involved in the uh, whole all actions that the European Union did uh, as far as uh, COVID crisis is concerned from the very beginning. Uh, for most of you, this complicated uh, construction of the data protection uh, authorities is well known, but for those uh, for whom it is not an everyday um, uh, matter to deal with the European law and the European administration, let me just say that the European Data Protection Supervisor is not the supervisor of all Europe as far as data protection is concerned. There are there is still 27 jurisdictions in 27 member states of the European Union. In some of the countries, it's even more complicated. Like in Germany, where part of the part of the issues are solved by the provincial authorities, land authorities. Uh, but apart from these 27 jurisdictions, there is the 28th jurisdiction, which is the EU bubble, EU institutions, bodies, and agencies. If you come to Brussels, and you have a data protection problem with the hotel or with the shop you go to the Belgian authority. That's the Belgian commission, which is responsible for uh, the data protection in Belgium. But when you have the problem like that with the EU institutions like the European Parliament, European Commission, or the agency, no matter if it is an agency which is located in Brussels, or the one which is in Dublin, or the one which is in Alicante or Warsaw, then the EDPS will be responsible. But what is the most important for our whole discussion today 
is the fact that EDPS, uh, at the same time, is the main advisor of the EU institutions, bodies, and agencies in all the legislative actions that are taken there. So when there is any kind of discussion about European law, European legislation, then that will be EDPS who will be taking part in it as the advisor of the Commission, Council, and the Parliament. And also the European Data Protection Supervisor is providing the European Data Protection Board with the Secretariat. And here is the main thing which I would like to distinguish at the very beginning of this discussion. This is European Data Protection Board, which is consisting of all the data protection authorities from all over Europe, and who is responsible for harmonized use of the data protection law and harmonized implementation of data protection law, and EDPS as a member of it, and also as the main advisor and the supervisor of the EU institutions, bodies, and agencies. So when the storm came, when we started to deal with the problem, uh, we had a surprising response at the very beginning from the member states. Surprising, because the response was to divide Europe again and to start to answer the question on the national level, which was sometimes a surprise, sometimes not a surprise. Uh, of course, you know, as well as I do, that uh, not all the things are harmonized on the all European level. And among those things which are not fully harmonized, we have both uh, uh, health issues, which are usually directed on the national level, and uh, internal affairs and national security and internal security, which uh, is also dealt, dealt with by the governments. So one of the first answers that have been given by the uh, countries was to try to stop the flow of the people and try to divide uh, the uh, jurisdictions, administrative uh, uh, constituencies uh, with the borders uh, that we almost forgotten about. I can tell that somebody has stolen my Europe. I was born in totalitarian countries in the East uh, in 1970s, uh, but from 1989, I started to get used to the fact that I can travel around, I can live in many countries uh, at the same time, I can use the possibilities of being European, especially in the Schengen zone, and it suddenly disappeared with the uh, COVID crisis, and we started to get more and more local answers, which were generally based on trust. These buzzwords, as I said, but buzzwords which will come back to us time after time, because trust was in the middle of the whole discussions. Let me start from the general observations, and then we will go uh, uh, deeper to the technological field, but also to the political answers that were given by the uh, European Union. What can, what, what can I find out looking back to last months? It happened just before the COVID crisis started. I was about to present the strategy of the European Data Protection Supervisor for another five years for the mandate that uh, I was elected uh, for by the Council uh, and by the Parliament. And I had to stop it because I found out that in the middle of March, I was about to present the strategy, which was not answering, uh, not even mentioning the main problem which exists in 2020, which is the COVID crisis. And I was talking about European solutions, going towards the global ones, uh, while I found out that the global issue start to be answered on the local level and national level. And I have to be somehow referred to that. And this is not only the question towards European Union as the uh, institution, but to all kinds of uh, international corporations, in fact. But at the same time, there were the things which uh, I was afraid, almost scared at the beginning. I thought that one of the main answers that may be given in such an extraordinary crisis that we have will be, okay, privacy doesn't matter. We have something more important to deal with, which is the health of the people, which is the life of the people. So we should forget about the privacy. That was what 
uh, some voices proposed uh, at the beginning of the crisis. But surprisingly, somehow for me, the privacy was that high on the agenda of the discussion that whatever kind of the discussion about the answers to what the crisis had started, uh, the privacy started to be one of the things uh, to be observed all the time, especially if we started to talk about any technical solutions uh, to be used. The second surprise uh, uh, that we can observe after these few months is that uh, the public in Europe generally shown quite a high trust toward the public institutions. Of course, there was a questioning of the competencies. There was questioning of the uh, individual actions that were taken or the behavior of the public administration or public servants, but generally people tend to think that the state wants to help, that the state should understand and should help and is ready to help. And those people who are actually in the first front line, these are the people who are uh, somehow managed and administrated by the public authorities. In some countries, that was quite a surprising thing because people are, were usually very skeptical towards the public institutions. The, another general observation is that the approach was very different from country to country and from population to population. And uh, that was not surprising that much because we knew that nobody was really ready for what happened. But we may say that we tried in Europe at least 20 different ways of approaching the problem. And inside the countries, we had a very different and very diverse approaches also to technical things. Uh, let me just uh, uh, remind that in the heart of the crisis, there were 800 IT solutions that were proposed to Italian government to help in the a COVID crisis, starting from the huge things prepared by the huge institutions towards the uh, hobby solutions proposed by the individual persons. And the Italian authorities had to dive through that and to find out, is there anything really interesting inside? And is there anything that may really help? And we had to learn, learn a lot. First of all, learn to talk with each other. And uh, I remember when I started to work as a data protection authority in my uh, own country of origin in Poland in 2010, I never thought that I will have to be a specialist in electricity and energy consumption and energy management in the country. And in a year, it found out that I had to learn all this because smart metering was, a, was the subject. Here I found out, and we found out, all of us who are working in the public administration, that we have to learn the new language that we never used. We thought that we know how to talk with the doctors of medicine. We thought that we know how to talk about the public health problems. But we found out that the language that epidemiologists are talking with us is different. They use the word surveillance as the useful tool. For the privacy advocates, surveillance is something that scares us. It's something that, that uh, means, okay, be aware, be ready, be uh, careful about that. For the person dealing with epidemiolo uh, epidemiology, this is one of the tools to be used. Normal one, the expected one. Surveillance is something that has to be done. So, uh, as I said, even the problem of exchanging and talking with each other started to be something that we have to be prepared for. Then another thing, uh, uh, this preference for the national uh, solutions uh, and preference for the solutions which will uh, help the society that we are dealing with. So the language was important, the, uh, the, the uh, distribution of the uh, information was important, and more, more, moreover, the public authorities in the health, uh, uh, in the health sector were somehow deciding on how the information is spread. But we found out very easily that the synergy helps. Also between the countries. One of the things we may, which we may say for the second wave, let's say, of the COVID crisis that comes or uh, that will come, is that we had the 20 paths we took, but now we can compare them 
we can find out which of them was better, which was worse. Those countries which are smaller can use the exa uh, uh, examples of the bigger ones. But also the big ones can say, we made something wrong, we can do it the way that the other country tried. That's what UK did, for example, with the, with the uh, uh, contact tracing uh, applications. Then uh, also, I have to say that there were many things which surprised me at the end. One of the things which surprised me was that uh, in one of the countries of the European Union, uh, there was a contact tracing app which was prepared with a huge involvement of the uh, academia, huge involvement of the NGOs, huge involvement of the individual uh, scientists, but in a very open way, actually accepted by all these uh, uh, societies, and it was not in use. Nobody downloaded it. Why? Because nobody in the society was really informed about it. The advertisement didn't work. I was in this country for two weeks and I didn't hear any advertisement of the, any public announcement that the application is available, although it was there. So sometimes you can do a lot of things well, but you fail in the last moment or you fail in the point which was not the, the one that uh, we, we uh, thought uh, will be the most important. And uh, the ultimate and the most important thing which we learned, we cannot earn trust during the pandemic if there was no trust before. Those countries which had the biggest problem to convince the people to uh, uh, work uh, together to fight with the pandemic uh, using the technological solutions proposed by the governments uh, or proposed by the public authorities uh, and who didn't build the real trust among the people before had to struggle more. What we also learned was that it's, however, very easy to lose the trust, even if you had it, uh, if we make one mistake. And this mistake might be, for example, that we are not open enough uh, in the solutions that we propose. So that was somehow the starting point when we were going, which we were going from, and uh, uh, it was the uh, final conclusion, maybe not final, interim conclusion that we may do at the moment. We do not need to commit the trade-off between the privacy and the data protection on one side and the public health on the other side, because we can talk about all these things together and uh, democracies uh, can have uh, both of them. And uh, at the same time, the regulator's scrutiny, so the, act, the, the involvement of the data protection authorities and the other authorities that are giving the public uh, scrutiny uh, is the must for the government. And uh, on longer terms, uh, we need to analyze the implications uh, and the solutions uh, that are existing for these uh, endemic problems inside these institutions, inside these uh, uh, um, uh, this networks that were created. So uh, cooperation, cooperation among the regulators is something that we can say as the data protection authorities uh, was important uh, for us. And uh, which of course in the complicated world of Europe and complicated world of the data protection in the world uh, is uh, not an easy thing. But once again, what we found was that it was much easier to deal with any kind of technical solutions in order to help in uh, fighting with pandemic in those countries that already had the checked and, uh, and uh, existing data protection system, while those that didn't have such, a comp uh, uh, such comprehensive solutions were struggling more. And we can see it very well in the states where any kind of uh, uh, the technical solution is questioned because of the lack of the real oversight over that. And uh, going a little bit farther, let's, take, let's say about the technical means that were used and their private, uh, privacy implications. First of all, uh, very early in the process, the countries which were uh, touched by the crisis have tried to use the technical solutions and the IT infrastructure and the telecom infrastructure in order to observe what's going on 
and to fight uh, with the results uh, of the crisis. The apps, applications uh, for the mobile phones uh, started to be the first solution that uh, was proposed uh, to the society itself. Some of the countries uh, tried to use uh, the central resources uh, and try to assess the information on central level, but they usually found out that without the current information coming directly from the people, they are blind. The best way to get this information was to use the telecommunication uh, networks uh, and to use the information which is collected from them. But the way it was used was very different. And uh, I may say that there were five main kind of applications that were proposed uh, during this crisis. The, the easiest and the most common were the information applications so that they were providing with the information about the symptom, symptoms, about medical service, about the medical equipment, tools, masks, te test facilities, and etc. cetera. Where, where you, can you get them? How can you, uh, how can you apply for them? Uh, what is the availability of that? But uh, very soon, the government started to follow the information from the applications and from the mobile networks in order to uh, find out how the people are moving inside the country and between the countries. And they started to prepare either mobility applications or mobility tracking systems. But because of the fact that the lockout was one of the very first answers that were given, mobility stopped to be that important at the beginning of the crisis. It starts to be important again now, where we still have the mobility between the countries, although sometimes stop, you, you probably heard that that's just Hungary a few days ago who decided not to allow anybody from abroad to enter the country if this is not the, uh, the, the, uh, the resident of, of Hungary. So once again, the kind of lockout starts. Uh, but uh, as I said, mobile apps, though they started to be the solution proposed at the beginning, uh, were forgotten for a while after that. Then we have infection tracing tools, very rare situation, but situation which existed in some countries. For example, in Israel, where we were tracking, uh, mainly tracking back, meaning assessing where the person was, those who were infected. And then we had quarantine apps, which were rather the surveillance uh, uh, tool used by the law enforcement authorities in order to, um, let's say, mobilize those who were under quarantine to, uh, to, to, to follow the rules uh, of the quarantine. And finally, contract tracing apps, which uh, were almost a silver bullet for many people. Uh, to, to fight with the uh, pandemic, although the specialists, both on the epidemiology side and on, on the IT side, were saying, no, this is only a tool, it may be helpful, but uh, without the normal trace, contact tracing, uh, and first of all, without the availability of the tests and the well-organized medical help, it's useless. So this is only a tool that may help, it may really help a lot. It may uh, put us in the better situation towards the epidemic itself, so we can start to go a little bit uh, uh, faster than the uh, infections uh, go. Uh, but uh, uh, as I said, only two. What I'm a little bit afraid of, and I stress it uh, time after time, is that we are just before the second wave of applications which might be a little bit more dangerous. The first one are so-called immunity passports and the green codes. So different kinds of applications which, which suggest that you can quantify if you are infected and you can quantify if the person is a danger for the people around. Uh, I'm really very, very cautious and I would like to be very careful about this kind of actually discrimination that would uh, allow us to think that the application itself and different kinds of sensors can tell us if the person can access the place, can be the passenger, can get into the building. We don't have anything against uh, the temperature checks that are done at the moment. 
but with the full uh, understanding that once again, it does not solve the problem because the persons who are infected usually do not show the symptoms of the uh, illness. And the person who is infected will not be even, uh, uh, even if tested, maybe uh, it, it may not be found because that's the too early stage of the infection. So the green passports, the immunity passports is a little bit of a, a magical approach to what the uh, IT can do. Even if we have the person who was uh, infected and who is uh, uh, healthy after that, who went through the whole COVID uh, uh, disease, we are not sure if the person, if, if herself or himself is immune, and if the person is not in the danger anymore for the rest of the people around. So we are trying to use the uh, technological answers, or let's say binary answers, uh, safe, not safe, to the things which we don't understand at the very end. It's a little bit more complicated with the e-health and mobile health uh, um, solutions. Uh, I think that this year we will have the explosion of the mobile health solutions, uh, and it's generally good. Uh, I, I have nothing against that. Uh, the mobile health or different kinds of wearables that we will use may be really very useful, but once again, only if we know what the data is used for and who is using the data, who has an access to this data, and how is it, uh, uh, how is it uh, uh, operated. That's, by the way, the thing that the data protection authorities were stressing from the very beginning, that the data protection law in Europe, general data protection regulation, but also the other solutions which exist in the countries uh, for, the, uh, for the health uh, system, are usually uh, well prepared for the uh, epidemics. Uh, even the GDPR has a precise rules which allow to take the special measures in case of uh, uh, the cross-border health problems. Uh, but with uh, some conditions sine qua non to be fulfilled. First of all, we agree that this is an extraordinary situation. And since it is extraordinary, all the solutions that we are creating are temporary. So it means we first of all know that this is not normal what we do. This is something extraordinary and all kinds of tracing also that we do are extraordinary. Uh, we know that that means also that we started to prepare ourselves to how to go out of that, how to uh, resign from the solutions that were proposed. And uh, we know who is using the data. We know for which purpose the data is used. And these purposes are connected only with the fight, uh, uh, with the epidemic fight for, for the health of the society, not for the other reasons. So the European Data Protection Board uh, was uh, uh, active in preparation of the European solutions, though we were not able, also not as EDPS, to propose one solution for all the European countries. There were some uh, harmonized approaches. There were some uh, harmonized, uh, uh, harmonized uh, uh, interoperable uh, frameworks that were proposed, but not all European uh, solution has been proposed so far. At the same time, there were some solutions on the business side that were going uh, uh, over the borders and that were helping all over Europe. And one of them, is the uh, cooperation between Google and uh, uh, Apple as far as interoperability of both of the operation systems are concerned, which in my opinion was a very good idea, but of course to be scrutinized as well, how uh, it looked uh, in the practice, how it worked. In the presentation that I'm leaving to you, you have uh, more information about different kinds of applications which were in use uh, in uh, uh, Europe but also you have an information about the problems that were known already at the beginning as far as the uh, efficiency of the solutions are concerned. Of course, the uh, diseases which were observed were not the one like, like, like COVID-19, uh, but uh, we had the use of the applications, mobile applications, uh, to track the infections uh, in uh, Ebola and some other infectious uh, diseases uh, in Africa. And uh, the several uh, 
scientific and practical studies on that have been already presented years before the COVID crisis started, but nobody actually uh, among the data protection specialists was aware of the existence of that. That's interesting, by the way, that there were the, the media specialists who had the studies on the use of the mobile apps uh, at the situation like that, but the data protection authorities and the lawyers as well, and uh, most of the IT uh, uh, and mobile, uh, the, the mobile application developers uh, didn't know about such, uh, such uh, solutions. Uh, I gave you in the presentation the uh, overview of the most vital discussion which happened in Europe, which was discussing a discussion about the kind of mobile transit have to be used in Europe. I did it because there was a lot of privacy involved in this discussion, which I'm very happy of, but also in order to show you that actually there was no black and white solution between these applications and these kinds of applications that were proposed as centralized and decentralized. First of all, there were more systems than two. And uh, secondly, uh, it, nobody was really able to say which of them in practice will work better and which of them in practice uh, is uh, uh, secure for the privacy. Uh, of course, the more decentralized systems were, the less information was attributed to the individual person. But actually, there was no system which was fully decentralized. There was always some central solution. And uh, secondly, even in those uh, that were uh, theoretically decentralized, decentralized uh, and theoretically uh, privacy friendly, the applications had also additional features the additional features which could be turned on or turned off by the user, which were changing the, the environment totally. And there was, for example, one of the data protection authorities in the country, in the European economic area countries, who stopped the, uh, the, the activity of the tracing app in his country uh, because the uh, location tracing uh, feature of the application, which was an additional one, was by default on. So everything was okay with the general use of the application, but the additional feature, which was collecting a lot of personal data uh, localized, uh, was turned on by default, which means that 90% of users uh, were actually using it. Uh, and the, the only thing was to, to do it other way around, uh, to have it turned, it, uh, turned off. And uh, uh, you also are probably aware of that, that the other data protection authority, the Dutch authority, has uh, not uh, uh, allowed to use seven consecutive uh, uh, attempts uh, to create the application in his country. Uh, once again, by failing to, 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 uh, um, uh, to uh, secure real privacy issues. And in those countries where the uh, solutions were, uh, were introduced into the market. It might happen, as I said, in the country, in one of the countries before, where everything was okay, but the public uh, uh, awareness uh, campaign was so bad that the application was simply not in use. At the same time, that's the, 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 probably the last uh, thing which I would like to stress. At the same time, in those countries that uh, uh, discussion was the most open, and the scrutiny of the uh, also uh, civic society through the NGOs uh, introduced very largely, like Germany, the uh, distribution of the applications was relatively higher than in other countries. And I think that the, 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 we shouldn't joke about Germans being very uh, strict about the rules and very strict about the social be behavior. I think that the main answer that uh, has been given by the uh, German society was there was an open discussion and we know who looked at this, we know what this pe person saw in these applications and we believe, we trust. We trust because we can see what's going on. Yeah? So as long as the solution is not mandatory, as long as the solution uh, is uh, well explained, 
as long as the solution is uh, uh, shows the effects, everything is uh, okay, and the data protection authorities and the data protection uh, law definitely do not stop the existence of uh, uh, such solutions. But you have to show that you are that you know what you want to use these applications for, and uh, I'm one of the first person who downloaded the application in all the countries that I was in and where the application existed. But I am also one of the first person to ask, uh, do you know what do you use it for? And this is also what the Norwegian authority said to their own government. Why, after two months from the introduction of the applications, you still don't have results? Why you have only the pilot projects that you do? Where are the information on how to erase the data? Where are the procedures that you should have in hand? So simply you created something, but it's just a toy. This is not a tool. This is a toy that probably says that the government uh, did something, but it does not say what will be the result of that. And one of the worst things that may happen is that because of the failure, either in the creating the awareness or in supervision of that, or in, uh, uh, first of all, in, in getting the real effects, we start to introduce more and more, uh, uh, more and more intrusive uh, solutions uh, from the technical point of view. I hope I didn't bore you to death. I'm ready for uh, discussion and I'm ready to answer the questions, which definitely uh, go at the moment uh, mostly to the question, do we really know what happened? Was it really uh, necessary? And uh, will this solution stay with us for the future? Thank you so much, Wojciech. You certainly didn't bore us. It was an absolutely tour de force because I think it was both insightful and informative. And I was really interested, as, as our audience would be, to get your observations. And I think it was really important that you started with the citizen, that it's about us, it's about our data, ourselves, our family, our friends. And I think that's the starting principle which you emphasize very clearly. But I think your observations also are very helpful. And I think the messages that you have sent out today and the learnings that you've described are very, very relevant. And particularly the issue of communication don't assume people know. And I think that's really important. Um, and in a way, um, you, you so powerfully describe the change in our world in the last six months, that we went you know, from not considering a lot of these things to looking at the whole issue of our own data, privacy and technology. Some very good things came out of it. But I think what was really powerful was, the, the, I suppose, and I know you've summarized it elsewhere, that big data means big responsibility. And that doing that, that we have to be ever vigilant, yet knowing how powerful using data like that is. Um, so I think, thank you so much for your presentation, because I think it's been really helpful and will be important to us. And I'll, I'll now go to the questions. Um, uh, one of the questions here, first one is, from your experience of the different European apps, are there examples of best practice you can identify in particular countries? This is from uh, Seamus Allen from the IIEA. First of all, uh, I think that we should for a while forget about the things that we generally think about some countries. Yeah. And we generally uh, think about their uh, effectiveness of the, of the solutions which are created there and even sometimes about the democratic standards that exist in these countries. Because uh, one of the countries that uh, uh, gave the very good example the others, at least in the first part of the fight with the COVID crisis, was a Singapore. Was Singapore? Singapore yeah. mm -hmm. is a country which I probably would not recommend as the kind of democracy that I would like to see mm -hmm. in the world. 
Uh, definitely, the data protection is not the thing which is on the top of the agenda in Singapore, although there, there is a data protection authority, but not uh, uh, responsible for, uh, is, they are not responsible for the public authorities and for the uh, data protection in the public authorities. But at the same time, the way that they addressed uh, the, the issue of uh, uh, applications to be used for, the, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for tracing uh, the infections, uh, was really exemplary, at least in the first part, uh, because it was open. Mm -hmm. Because it was open. In the meaning that everybody could see the code, everybody could see what is going on there, everybody could see what is processed, and uh, uh, which kind of data states were. Mm -hmm. Of course, later on, there was a problem of mandatory use, uh, there was a problem of the use of the persons, with the persons who didn't have the uh, the, the, who didn't give any kind of consent or uh, agreement on uh, the use uh, of uh, these uh, uh, tools. Uh, there has been uh, accusations about uh, uh, the use for the, the wrong purposes, but the first thing, openness was something to be really present. What was also good was that the developers of the Singaporean application said while we are preparing something which is good for the Singapore authority, for Singapore uh, society, it does not necessarily work in the other countries. And that's one of the things which we have to be in mind as well. Mm -hmm. That something which is very good in the in country A can not work in country B because of the non-technical reasons. The countries which uh, were dealing the best with the use of this kind of tools were the countries which, first of all, are more or less isolated geographically, mm. because then you can uh, somehow uh, control the uh, people entering the country and living in the country. That's, for example, the, uh, the that is an example of uh, Singapore, but also the South Korea, although the South Korean example definitely was not democratic. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, um, that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, those countries that were generally in the state of kind of alert, uh, shown more uh, willingness, people shown more willingness uh, to apply the solution proposed by the governments. So Taiwan, South Korea, yeah. Singapore again, the countries which uh, present themselves as being under the threat from abroad mm -hmm. are more, t the, the societies are more tempted to follow the instructions of the government, while those countries that are, that are mainly in the mainland of the continents and who are not presenting the, their societies as those being, uh, uh, being uh, endangered by some uh, external forces, are probably more discussing and having more doubts about this uh, about the solutions. Anyway, openness is definitely one of the things that I would propose. The second thing I would propose the involvement of the uh, not only data protection authorities, not only the supervisory authorities, but also the uh, public scrutiny uh, to the different kind of NGOs, consumer organizations uh, on the very early stage. There were also the situations where the, some of the uh, international humanitarian organizations uh, were taking part in the preparation of such a solution. Well, I, I recall Austrian examples and the, and the um, involvement of the uh, Red Cross in the preparation of the application uh, there. These were the solutions uh, from the organizational point of view, which I would uh, propose. Uh, if we think about the technical solutions, uh, it has been somehow proved that the uh, results uh, so far, the best results as far as the contact tracing apps uh, were shown by the Bluetooth low energy uh, s systems, uh, while the uh, telecom data is hardly useful uh, for the uh, for the contact tracing uh, uh, purposes, and uh, uh, what is once again important is the uh, raising awareness among the people that the solution exists, and the solution will be useful only if the certain amount of the population will be using the the the, uh, the IT solution. But Wojciech, I think your point is very well made, and I think it can be really used for other communications within that you know letting people know about things and involving them and of course as you say the main thing is trust 
Um, and I, you know, it's interesting in Ireland, uh, the Irish Computer Society did a study back in April. And interestingly enough on whether people would, you know, would at this stage, it was for the contract tracing app, would they be willing to use personal data or medical data uh, to help, you know, fight uh, the pandemic? And interestingly enough, 87% of the population said yes. But I think even more so interesting, between 18 and 24, 93% said they would use it and the over 55s. So the, the, the willingness of people is there, but you still have to provide that trust in order to actually move things forward. And we have to remember that there are two different questions. The yes. first question is, will you give your personal data yes. in order to help to fight with pandemic? And 90% of people will say, yes, of course, I will. Yeah? Yes. But if you ask, will you do it, giving it to the Ministry of Interior? Yes. Probably the answer might be different. Yeah. So the, what is very important is to show that there is, a, the, the, there is a synergy between the fact that there are authorities who know what to do, Yes. Or, uh, or the organization does not need to be the public authority, but it can be the, the organization that know what to do and the willingness of people to help. Yes. I'm sure that all of the people who are here would say, I would do everything I could yes. to help to fight with pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah? But uh, the, the, it's a different thing when you ask, uh, would you give it uh, European uh, officials in Brussels uh, yes. uh, to decide yes. about what's do, done with your data? Would you allow Vivirovsky to deal with your data? You will probably have 5% of people who will say yes. that Vivirovsky is the person to create the application. And I'm not surprised because I cannot code. Yeah. yeah. So that there should be, there should be a, 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 well, it should be well explained. That exactly. those people who are preparing that are those who know to, how to do it from the technical point of view, mm -hmm. those who know how to do it from the uh, fundamental rights point of view, but first of all, that they know what, what to do it for the health reasons. Yeah. So there are epidemiologists who are taking part in it. Mm -hmm. There are the doctors of medicine, and over them, there is a, a, there, there is a real infrastructure of the health system mm -hmm. and uh, of the... Uh, of the civil servants, but also the uh, uh, volunteers that are taking part in preparation of the all country uh, solution for the pandemic situation. Yes, I think that point is very well made. And just on the, the Irish situation, you know, a million people downloaded it within 20, 48 hours because there was that connect. But I think it's really interesting your point about that ecosystem of knowledge, uh, which covers a whole array of specialties, particularly uh, mental health or, or public health specialists, but also mental health, uh, civil servants. And when the politicians come in, I think countries, I don't know if you think, countries who have left the data, discussing the data, its implications, what has happened, what is happening, what we should do, is often better delivered by people who are trusted, who have the facts and who are scientists. I think, what do you think? Um, I'm, I don't want to say if the scientists are the most uh, uh, trusted persons in the society, yeah. uh, but I think that there is, a, that there is a work to do to find out those who can really present something from the scientific point of view, mm. who can do it from the legal point of view, but also those who are sometimes celebrities who know yeah. how to, uh, how to uh, communicate, uh, communicate yeah. how to uh, mm. touch the people, how to uh, talk with them, how to explain the things. Sometimes mm. uh, uh, two sentences said uh, by the TV star is more influential uh, than uh, something which is said by the best uh, uh, scientists that you have in the country and that probably is unknown for the 99% of the society. Mm. But uh, what is important to, 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 to show is that this, these people are working together. Yes. And they, they yeah. are there all together. Yeah. The very good examples of, I don't know, the, the, for example, the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand. Yeah. Yes. She's a wonderful lady. Mm -hmm. And definitely she's not the one that is inventing these things. She yeah. is the politician who knows how to present it to the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is a group of the people over, the, over behind her, her. And, yeah. uh, behind her. And you can uh, show that this is or, or organized. And if I can 
have some doubts about uh, uh, the all European approach to this subject is where we really uh, convincing, uh, showing that there is a European Union solution that we can propose yeah. uh, for this subject, or there will be more and more people in, in Europe who will be saying that when we had a crisis, we had to go to the national level and to, to solve it on national level, while the real uh, reason for that was that we do not have the harmonization of the health systems between the countries. Yeah, I mean, you have called for this European um, pan-European contacting tracing app to be launched. Yes. Uh, do you believe that would, would there be an effective response? I think that if we, if we create the interoperable solution, interoperable framework for that, uh, yeah. that will be enough. Because I'm not surprised uh, that uh, the Portuguese person wants to have this information in Portuguese uh, uh, applied the way that is done in Portugal and not necessarily the one which is uh, in Estonia, Sorry, yeah. which is in Poland. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not uh, surprised that much that it may differ from country to country but at least the collection of the data and exchange of the data uh, should be done in the uh, interoperable framework. Well, I, I live right now in Brussels, which is a very co cosmopolitan town. And uh, I, I'm sure that in the building where I'm working uh, in, there are the people who have the, who have the mobile phones of the companies uh, uh, from 20 uh, states yeah. of Europe. Yeah? Yeah. But my, my private telephone, which is just next to me on the table, uh, is uh, provided by the uh, Polish company. And I, I have to mm. even observe this uh, f famous uh, fair play uh, uh, rules uh, between the operators. Yeah? Mm. So there, there are different uh, applications, applications, there are different uh, mm. uh, mobile phones which are around. It's enough if they are interoperable. And that's why I said that I, I welcome, for example, the uh, cooperation between uh, Apple and Google oh, yes. uh, creating the, the, the common environment. That's, yeah. that's the part of interoperability that should stay. Yeah. Thank you for that. There's, there's one question, I think time is catching up on us, and I think unfortunately it'll have to be our last, but it's from Asti uh, from the University of Turin. And she asked the question, do you think that COVID-19 outbreak and the relevant measures justify the use of technology, tools or practice deviating from usual data security standards in medical devices with the aim of facilitating speedy and safe response to health emergency situations? Uh, it, it's hard for me to say about the, uh, the, the solutions which are proposed in the, uh, for the medical devices in the medical law, mm. but I may say Yes, the extraordinary situation allows yeah. us to use extraordinary tools. But the conditions in Ecuador for that is that we know that it's temporary. We know it's extraordinary. We know uh, who is doing that, for which purpose, and we know who is controlling that, mm. who is scrutinizing that. We have the system to assess what happened and what is happening with the, uh, this data. So I, I, I'm not surprised that we are using the special tools. That, that's, uh, that's a little bit like asking, uh, can, I use, uh, uh, the, uh, can I use the blanket of my neighbor to extinguish the fire in my own yes, house? Yeah, yes, I yeah. can, but yeah. I have to know that I'm destroying the blanket of the, uh, the neighbor. Of the neighbor. And I probably will be uh, responsible for that. And mm -hmm. there is somebody who is able to check, uh, was it my blanket or was it his blanket? Yeah. Yeah. So there should be the supervision, it should be oversight. And uh, even if we think, uh, uh, if we go out from the uh, panel responsibility or financial responsibility, there is a need to assess now what did we do in this last months yeah. in order to do it better the next time it will happen. Mm. Well, unfortunately, time has caught up with this Wojciech and I want to thank you for your excellent presentation at Tour de Force. And we, we are left with a lot of clear messages. Tremendous communicator, I have to say, but emphasizing the importance of communication, trust, and again, that the responsibility about using that data, as you said there, has also, you know, using big data means that enormous responsibility, but we have the capability. And I think the learnings that you have 
documented there for us will help us in the future. So thank you very much for that. It was really, really very, very interesting and insightful. Um, I'd like thank to you thank you for, 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 for the questions uh, as well. Yes, I was just going to say to thank our audience for their attendance and for their active participation and questions. Um, and also, you'll be glad to know that on the 17th of September, if you could link in, and I hope our audience will be, we have Car Cameron uh, Kerry, you know, from the Brookings Institute. And yes. as you know, he's focused on privacy and data transfer. And I think he has a provocative title, Wojcik, which I think you'd appreciate. The European Court of Justice challenges the world. I think that is quite provocative, and then we'll see what happens. So I'm not surprised by this no, uh, title, no. uh, but I also know that Cameron is uh, approaching the things like that, uh, not only as a scientist from Brookings Institution, but also as a person who has a lot of experience, both in the business, uh, but also in the public administration. Well, I, I, I got to know him in uh, yes, uh, 2012, yeah. I guess, as the representative of the uh, American well, we, we, we'll tell him we were talking to you when, when we talk to him in a week or so. And I'd finally like to thank our IIEA production team, Sarah Burke and Lorcan Mullally uh, and the team, and Seamus Allen, um, our policy uh, researcher who's uh, contributed a lot to this webinar. But most of all, I want to thank you, Wojciech, for a really excellent presentation. And we wish you well, and we wish you every success in your work. And we hope to see you, of course, in Dublin at a later stage when things have moved on, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. I lost Thanks. two possibilities to go to Dublin because Absolutely. of the COVID crisis. Thank, thank you, you very much. much again. And thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all again.